since David Cameron became your leader in 2005, the British Conservative Party has tried to talk about conservative principles in a different way and apply them differently. Maybe you could tell our viewers a bit about what you have been doing in that regard. Well, when David Cameron became leader in 2005, the Conservative Party was recovering from a third successive election defeat. And Conservative fortunes were at the lowest ebb that they'd been for generations. Um, we'd been used to being the dominant party throughout the 20th century. And of course, with towering figures like Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher, there was a sense in which the Conservative Party had begun to feel that it was the natural party of government. It was difficult to adjust to the fact that the Labour Party had now secured an unprecedented third term. David recognized that what we needed to do was to show that the Conservative Party was a natural, mainstream, moderate party again. During the period when we'd been in opposition, we'd done what opposition parties often do, which is listen too much to our own core supporters and insufficiently to those voters who, who shared our values, but who'd been put off by the, the stridency with which we'd put our case and by the fact that we'd concentrated on issues which they agreed with but which were marginal. We'd said less than we should have done about the need to improve the health service. We'd been less articulate than we should have been on the need to transform education. Instead, we'd concentrated on, on issues like uh, Europe and, and immigration, where we were playing to the home team, pandering to our core vote, as it were. David recognised that needed to change. And as well as giving us a, a compelling message on social issues, he also embraced causes like the environment, which weren't traditionally conservative, but which are not in the least inconsistent with actually most conservative instincts, the desire to hand on to the next generation um, an enhanced inheritance. And David also changed the way in which the Conservative Party spoke. We'd tended, I think, in the previous 10 or 12 years to be a party that looked as though it was raging against the modern world. And actually conservative movements have been most successful when they've been on the side of progress emancipation, giving individuals more power and control over their lives. The, the Reagan, the Thatcher, the Mulroney success was all about being on the side of, of change and emancipation in the 1980s. So David made sure that our party talked more optimistically about the future and about the potential changes both that technology and changes in society could bring, which would once more allow the individual to exercise greater sovereignty over their own lives. How has your base reacted to that, your core supporters? Well, when David took over as leader, I think there were some core supporters who were a little uncertain. They recognized that he'd run on the basis of taking the party back into the mainstream. And so there was some concern that perhaps some of the, uh, the core issues which had kept the party united during that difficult time might be downgraded. But what's been remarkably successful about David's leadership is the way in which there's been no dilution of essential conservative principles. We've been consistently over the last four years the party of sound money. We've been the party that's argued that, for example, um, the uh, Labour government have been building up an unsustainable deficit, that the level of state spending is such that uh, it doesn't just unbalance the economy, it actually risks us losing our credit rating um, and our position to be able to, to service our own position in the world economy. Now, that traditional sound money argument is very much the case that Margaret Thatcher was putting in the 1980s. It's very much the sort of fiscal conservative argument that I think most centre-right parties would be most comfortable with. Now, David was always clear that that argument had to be made. And I think as a result of making sure that on those central issues of, of economic management, and also of national sovereignty, because David was critical of the trend towards European integration, because he was clear on those areas. He had permission from the base to move to the centre on issues of social policy like health and education, um, and also on the environment as well. Many of your political opponents would say that you're saying the right things in order to get elected, but that you haven't changed the sort of principles that alienated many sort of uh, centrist voters in the mm. past. How do you respond when people from the, social de from the Liberal Democrats, I should say, and from uh, the Labour Party make that accusation? Well, in a sense, our opponents are always going to, to doubt our motives and to argue that any change is either superficial or skin deep. But actually, the fact that there have been some criticisms from uh, some of our supporters in the, in the conservative press, some of our erstwhile supporters in the conservative press, actually underlines the extent of change. One of the striking things about David Cameron's leadership is that he won the leadership election and has managed to take the party into the centre without the strong support of any principal conservative 
columnist. And one of the things about British political culture is that there are individual columnists, particularly on the right, who have huge popular followings and who, who can help shape the political landscape. Um, and they've been angry with David because they regard some of the things that he said on health and education and some of the policy changes he's made as a desertion of the type of um, uh, pure and hard and um, crystalline conservatism that they'd like to see. Um, so their reaction, to my mind, underlines the degree of change. And in my own area of education, um, we've been explicit that we endorse the idea of socially comprehensive education. Um, in the past, the Conservative Party was associated with the idea of socially selective education. And early in David's leadership, when he made it clear that we weren't going to go back to a system of socially selective education, there was a backlash from some, both inside and outside the party. But David saw through that backlash, stuck to a particular position, and now there's a widespread acceptance that our policies on education, in particular our desire to see more money spent on the education of the very poorest, mark us out as occupying progressive territory. Now, you've talked about the British Conservative Party making a clear decision to reach beyond its core supporters. Right now, the main party of the right in the United States, the Republican Party, seems to be doing a very good job energizing its core supporters, um, but alienating a lot of people outside that, that area of core support. Uh, what do you and your party colleagues think about the direction the Republicans are taking? Well, it's always difficult when you're a politician from one country to try to um, uh, offer lessons or advice to sister parties or to uh, political movements that you admire in other countries. Um, humility is the first thing that you should accept as you, you approach those jurisdictions. But one of the things that, um, looking at America, I feel, is that um, I know what it's like to be in a party or a movement that's been in power and is suddenly ejected. There is a tendency to turn in on oneself. And there's a tendency, because you feel that conservative ideas have been rejected, to spend time with other people who share your views um, and to uh, essentially, um, instead of talking to others, spend time in an echo chamber. Now, it's entirely understandable psychologically why people who've suffered a defeat want to have their own views validated and reinforced by spending time with other people who agree with them. But the crucial thing is that in order to win an election, manifestly, you have to construct a majority, and that the Republicans have been successful in the past when they've spoken, not just for their core support, but for the mainstream and for independence as well. Now, it's not for me to offer specific advice to the Republican Party on the direction in which they should go, but I would say that <clears throat> those Republican leaders who uh, are capable of reaching out to moderates um, and to uh, Democrats are people who I hope that the Republicans will continue to listen to in the future. I think that John McCain, even though he lost, um, is someone who is widely respected across the American political spectrum. I think that Rudy Giuliani, even though he didn't succeed in securing the nomination, is someone who was able to exercise Republican leadership in a traditionally Democrat area. Um, and I think that movements like the, um, uh, the New Majority movement that uh, David Frum is behind, which deliberately seek to ensure that the Republican Party has as broad a base as possible, are worth drawing on. And I think that if you look in particular at those Republicans in the past who've been successful, those giants of the party, Teddy Roosevelt, Eisenhower, Reagan, what marks them out is an optimism, a sense of welcome to new supporters, um, and a sense of um, uh, hope about what the American political system can achieve. Um, and I think that the Republican Party will be at its best and in its best position to continue to serve America in the future if it maintains that optimistic, front foot, emancipatory um, appeal. Most political philosophies seem to be grappling with how they should define themselves in the 21st century, liberalism, socialism, all sorts of political philosophies. What do you think conservatism should represent in the decades to come? I think the first thing is that conservatism should be about the emancipation of the individual, giving each individual the chance to be uh, author of their own life story in control of what happens um, uh, in their future. And that's why I think that education is so important to the conservative message at the moment, giving each young person the qualifications, the skills, the tools to be able to take control of their lives. But it's not just education. We want to make people independent because independence gives them dignity um, and it also gives them the chance to shape their lives in accordance with their wishes. So that means that we want to ensure that welfare policy 
is not just about giving people a cushion on which they can recline for the rest of their lives. It's about giving people a springboard which allows them to move on to the next successful stage in their lives. But conservatism is never just about the individual. It's also about what makes a good society. And it's about recognizing that if you give the state too much of a role in building the good society, you crowd out that spirit of civic endeavor, of voluntarism, of spontaneous collective action, which actually is most effective in generating the sorts of results that all of us would like to see across society. Specifically, when we're dealing, for example, with um, some of the most broken and vulnerable in our society, it's often faith groups or civil society that's best equipped to help people put their lives back together. And I think conservatism understands instinctively that if you try to have a homogenous, one-size-fits-all approach to social problems, and you try to give the state too much of a role, you miss that human dimension, which can help um, uh, recover those fractured lives and put people back um, on, on a course for, um, for success. There's one other dimension as well. It's not just the individual, it's not just the social. It's also the role of your nation in the world. And I think one of the things that's important for all conservative parties, particularly in the English-speaking world at the moment, is to stand up broadly for for Western values, for the values of our civilization when they're under attack. And that's why I think, for example, the fight in Afghanistan, the fight against extremism at home and abroad is a defining cause at the moment. We all need to ensure that we stand together um, and that we recognize that um, foreign policy is not just a matter of projecting um, our, um, our interests abroad, it's standing up for those values, democracy, tolerance, the rule of law, which are at the heart of what makes our civilization admirable. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.